Okay, good morning. So last time we were on the cerebellum, and I mentioned that if you have a cerebellar lesion, you get this ipsilateral ataxia. And uh, the general rule with the cerebellum is the further lateral the lesion is, the more distal the ataxia is. So that if we have a lesion in the cerebellar hemispheres, which are more lateral, then we tend to get much, a lot of ataxia with the hand, right? So any movement uh, as the patient tries to coordinate something with their hand is very clumsy. The closer we get to the midline, and remember the midline portion of the cerebellum is called the cerebellar vermis, then the more midline the ataxia is. Okay, and so with a vermis lesion, the main problem is not so much distal hand clumsiness, like finger to nose, but then the walking becomes very unsteady. Okay, and so an ataxic gait, um, which often happens in conditions like alcoholism, which tends to be toxic, especially to the midline of the cerebellum, um, these patients walk with a wide-based, very unsteady gait, and we call that an ataxic gait. Okay, the flocula nodular lobe of the cerebellum, which we'll see better when we uh, go through a very fine cross-section um, of the brain stem and the cerebellum. Uh, this is very important for coordinating eye movements. Okay, so just like the cerebellum coordinates the arms and legs, it also coordinates how your eyes move. And so if we have a problem there, patients have nystagmus. All right, so first let's just show you um, a patient here. Okay, hopefully it doesn't ruin the recording, but uh, let's just show you a patient. I put a, a bunch of videos here and we'll see how much time we have to get through these today. But here's a good example of a patient with ataxia. So we can check this in several different ways. It's actually a good test to try to put a cap on a pin. That's hard to do if you've got some ataxia. Yeah, she has a shirt there. To, uh, it's kind of hard for her. So that's kind of what ataxia looks like, a little clumsiness. And then she's trying to reach out and grab it, and you can see her hand shaking. And now just go from okay. the nose, the tip of the pin, back and forth. And then trying to reach out. And usually the ataxia, it's the last inch or two, coming back to the nose or to reach out to touch your finger. Uh, that's where you tend to see most of it. Okay, so in the lecture on the cerebellum, we will um, go through a whole bunch of different conditions um, that can cause ataxia. Okay, so remember that for now, just learn it, and then we'll explain the rationale why later. But if you have a lesion in the right cerebellum, it's the right side of the body that's going to uh, have ataxia. It's ipsilateral. Okay, and it's actually because the pathways cross twice, okay, that we get the ataxia ipsilateral. But again, more on that later. Okay, the next part of the neurologic examination are reflexes. And so reflexes are a monosynaptic connection here. When you tap on a tendon, like right here on the patellar tendon, that stretches the quadriceps muscle. Okay, and um, again, the details of this are in the spinal cord lecture, but when the quadriceps muscle or any muscle stretches, there are these muscle spindles that are embedded within the, the bulk of the muscle. And so these muscle spindles get stretched. And so we have this very rapid signal and I said it's monosynaptic, so it goes right back here to, um, sometimes these are called alpha motor neurons, uh, anterior horn cell is the same thing. So we've used the term anterior horn cell. Remember, these are the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord. Because notice, these lower motor neurons are supplying muscle, okay? So when you move your quadriceps, it's the anterior horn cell or alpha motor neuron. All right, so tapping on the tendon then activates this anterior horn cell to go back to the quadriceps. The quadriceps contracts and the leg kicks out. Okay, so this is the, uh, there are three common upper extremity reflexes that we test, two in the lower extremity, but it's the same theme for all of these. Tap the tendon, stretch the muscle, and you get a signal that goes right back to the muscle. Okay, so uh, reflexes, 
the, I mentioned we check three in the upper extremity. Um, and these are the nerve roots. So, you know, it's entering the spinal cord. So it has to go into a nerve root and out of a nerve root. And so this is quite practical to know the nerve roots that we're assessing um, as we do this. So for biceps and brachioradialis, okay, we'll talk about these two muscles. These are C5, C6 muscles. Okay, of course, you know the biceps flexes the elbow. The brachioradialis does also. It's a muscle right here in the forearm. Okay, and then when you move your thumb to your shoulder, that's kind of a little more the action of the brachioradialis muscle. But these are both enter the spinal cord at C5 and C6. Okay, and so in both cases here, we should see some elbow flexion when we check those. The triceps reflex um, is, is really, now I included C8 here because um, most all of your uh, review books will list C8 as triceps, but there have been some really good recent studies um, using a test called EMG that have shown that there's very little C8 in triceps. But I put it there just because, um, you know, it's going to take boards seven or eight years probably to catch up with that. So um, the reality is that triceps is, is mainly C6 and C7, but we'll include C8 for now. Okay. So triceps, um, triceps muscle extends the arm. Okay. And so we tap on the triceps tendon right here and we get elbow extension when we tap on that tendon. In the lower extremities, of course, the patellar assesses the L2, 3, 4 nerve roots and the spinal cord circuit at those levels. And the Achilles reflex is S1 and S2. And so I'm just going to go back here. Um, I showed you the patient um, last time that had ALS. And um, ALS is a very complex condition because I told you it affects lower motor neurons, um, but it also affects upper motor neurons. And so I'm just going to show you the reflex exam of this patient. Um, and we'll notice that some reflexes tend to be rather brisk, some, some you can't get. Okay, I'm just noticing the difference here in the muscle bulk in the two hands, and you've noticed that in that left hand, particularly, there's been some muscle loss right here in this space, the first dorsal interosseus, um, really is a significant amount of atrophy so right that's there. Lower motor neuron. Okay. Now, you feel the pinprick sharply oh, sorry. there? Sorry. Okay. You need to watch the hole there here. here. Okay, feel sharp like a pin. And let me just check a few reflexes. There we go. Okay, I'm going to go over here. Okay, so here's the bicep reflex. Very brisk there. This is brachioradialis. And tricep. I don't know if you can see that there. Curl the fingers in just a tiny bit there. Okay, here's a reflex you don't need to know about. But I'm checking it in there. Check over here. And I can't get the biceps there, notice. Reflex seem to be absent here in, this left arm. in the left arm. Although I'm going to explain that here. Just present there. Okay. Here okay, are the patella reflexes. Okay. Let's see some cross adductor reflexes. And then Down here's here. the Achilles reflex. You can see when you tap on the um, Achilles tendon there that you stretch the gastrocnemius, which wants to plantar flex. So when you tap on the Achilles reflex, the foot should um, go down. Okay, now the last thing I'll show you here is we also, as part of the reflexes, we assess for something called clonus. And so notice I'm gonna give the ankle a quick dorsiflexion. Let the leg relax. <laughs> I was able to get about four beats of clonus earlier. And so I'll show you clonus in a little bit, but clonus is if you dorsiflex the foot where it, it just keeps shaking like that. Okay, so let's explain the significance of all of this. Okay, so we grade reflexes. <coughs> on a, one, a zero to four scale. Zero is if you can't get the reflexes. 
Okay? Now, some people just normally don't have reflexes. Um, okay? I used to have a student come down. We had an exam table, and I would demonstrate how to show reflexes. And a uh, one-year student came down. He just had no reflexes. So that occasionally happens. But absent reflexes, especially if they had been present and then they disappear, is a lower motor neuron finding. So in the ALS patient I just showed you, I couldn't get reflexes in his left arm. And remember, that's the arm where he had the atrophy, where we saw the first dorsal interosseous muscle had wasted. And so he has a lower motor neuron process going on in his left arm, and so I can't get reflexes there. So we want to associate an absence of reflexes with a lower motor neuron condition. Okay, and in ALS, the problem is with those anterior horn cells in the spinal cord. Those are lower motor neurons. Okay, two we will call just normal, and a one or a three means, well, a one would be you can get it, but maybe it's a little bit challenging. You just can feel it a little bit. A three means the reflexes are brisk or hyperactive. Okay, but um, very important with reflexes is we always ask, are they symmetrical or not? Okay, so if we have reflexes that are a one, two, or a three, and they're symmetrical, then that's normal. Okay, so one, two, or a three um, here are all normal. Two is a normal normal, okay, but a one or a three is just trying to describe they're either not very brisk or they are brisk. When we use a four, we classify reflexes as a four, that's abnormal. <coughs> okay, and a four plus reflexes, uh, that's what you saw when I tapped on the patellar uh, tendon. The leg really jumped out. Um, and so this is... Uh, suggestive of an upper motor neuron process. So the reflex examination is really important because if I'm seeing someone in the emergency room and maybe they're weak all over, and that can be an upper motor neuron problem or a lower motor neuron problem, and so if, I, if you just gave me two or three things that I could check on examination, one of them would be reflexes. If the reflexes are abnormally brisk, then I know I'm dealing with an upper motor neuron process. If I can't get any reflexes, then I know I'm dealing with a lower motor neuron process, and that's going to help narrow down the list of what it might be, and that'll also guide what kind of studies uh, I'm going to do on the patient. All right, now along with the uh, reflex assessment, we also do what is called the extensor plantar response, usually called the Babinski. Okay, and what you do is you Take a, a sharp object. Um, usually it's the, um, so I brought my reflex hammer. Here, this is a little better quality than the one you get as a medical student. But you notice that the, this side has a little sharp end. Okay, and so I'll just scrape that along the back of the foot. And we start with the lateral uh, plantar surface and then move forward to the toe. Okay, and normally nothing happens, or the toe might curl down. Okay, but if we scrape the bottom of the foot and we see this, the big toe goes up, uh, we would say that's um, an upgoing toe or a positive Babinski. Okay, and this is an upper motor neuron finding. Okay, and so the mechanism, why do reflexes get brisk in an upper motor neuron condition? Why do we see a Babinski in an upper motor neuron condition? Um, we need to show you the spinal cord circuits, which we will do in the spinal cord lecture before that will make any sense. Okay, so for now, just to recognize if you've got an upgoing toe, if you see that in a case study, you want to say, okay, that's an upper motor neuron finding. Yes? Yeah, so uh, actually there are some reflexes, like uh, newborns do have a Babinski, but it goes away with normal development and myelination of the central nervous system. Yep, when all of my kids were born, I was checking the Babinski and watching to see when it would go away. So uh, yeah, it, it goes away usually within a few months. Right, and these are actually other reflexes that are, um, we call them frontal lobe release signs that are present in infants uh, frequently th and then that go away. Now, why do we check these? Well, if we have a condition that emerges later in life, and usually these are conditions that involve a lot of the frontal lobes, um, so that could be Alzheimer's or a number of other neurodegenerative conditions, then we see these reflexes come back again. Okay, so these are abnormal if you find them in adults. So one is the glabellar sign. Okay, and to do that, 
you tap on the glabella. And normally a patient will maybe just blink once or twice. Okay, but if they blink every single time, then that would be a positive glabellar sign and might suggest that there's kind of a diffuse frontal lobe um, process. Okay, the snout reflex, we can take a tongue depressor or something like that and tap on the lateral uh, mouth and we see some puckering of the lips uh, when you do that. The palmomental reflex, <coughs> don't ask me how this one works, but if you take something sharp, again, like the back of your reflex hammer and you scrape the palm, you actually see wrinkling of the chin on the same side, okay? And I, um, so I check this in uh, when I'm doing a dementia evaluation because, again, uh, a lot of dementia syndromes involve a lot of the frontal lobe, and so these reflexes come out. So if you see someone with Alzheimer's, just scrape the palm, and if you see the chin wrinkle on that side, that's abnormal. That's a frontal lobe release sign. Um, the grasp reflex is where you take your fingers and you just gently stroke it in the palms of the patient. Okay? And again, typically in an advanced neurodegenerative condition like Alzheimer's, it's a reflex and the patient can't help but they grab onto your fingers. Okay? And so I've seen patients you know, in an advanced stage of dementia, they don't know who their spouse is, um, you know, they're bed bound, and so you just come and stroke their fingers and you can just lift them out of the bed because the reflex is so strong to hold on to your fingers. Okay, and uh, clonus, again, I'm going to show you a video here in just a little bit, but when you dorsiflex the foot and you see the foot continue to shake like that, that is another upper motor neuron finding. Okay, so if you see clonus described on an exam, that's one of many things that you want to put on the checklist here for upper motor neuron. All right, and finally, we'll finish here with gait. So when we have a patient walk, uh, just ask the patient, please walk up and down the hallway. And, you know, I'm usually with two medical students and, and other people, and patients will say, well, it's hard to relax. I've got so many people watching me walk. But you want to try to ha just have the patient relax, walk down the hallway, and come back. And then usually we'll make it difficult for them. And so to make it difficult for them, we have them walk heel to toe, to walk a line. Okay, and so uh, most people can do that unless you've got some orthopedic or neurologic problem. And so heel to toe walking just makes it more challenging. And if you've got a gait problem, then oftentimes you'll see a patient quite unsteady uh, when they try to do heel to toe um, walking. So uh, gait evaluations, I think, are just fascinating because there's so many different ways that patients walk depending on what kind of a problem they have. Okay, and as you begin to learn these, um, you know, you can just enjoy going to a mall and watching a lot of people, and eventually you're going to find someone walking differently, and you can try to figure out what they might have. Okay, so we'll divide gait into asymmetric and symmetrical gait disorders. Um, so an asymmetrical gait, Trendelenburg would be an example of that. And so this could be someone with hip problems, or um, I will tell you when we uh, get to peripheral nerves, uh, maybe anatomy has talked about this already, but if you have weakness of the gluteus medius muscle, you lose that hip stabilization and the hip tends to drop down um, when you're walking. Okay, so that's an asymmetric gait, that's a Trendelenburg. A hemiplegic gait is another example of an upper motor neuron condition. All right, so a patient, let's say, that's had a middle cerebral artery stroke. Okay, let's say it's on the left side. So they're weak on the right side of the body. And over time, what happens if they don't get their strength back is that the arm tends to go into a flexed position, and the leg, and especially the foot, tends to go into an extended position like this. Okay, and so the patients that have had a stroke, and that's upper motor neuron, right? It's really like corticospinal tract. Um, they walk like this, with a flexed arm, and because the toes are pointed down, they have to swing the leg around like this when they walk. And that's called circumduction. Okay, so you circumduct the leg as you walk. Okay, so if you're seeing someone walk like that, you know they've had a lesion in the opposite hemisphere, and it's upper motor neuron. Okay, a steppage gait is where a patient has a foot drop. Okay, and in, in the second year neuroscience course, we will give you six causes of a foot drop. 
Okay, but for now, let's just list one. The perineal nerve um, supplies the uh, muscle in the leg called the tibialis anterior, and that's the muscle that dorsiflexes your foot. Okay, and so if you have a lesion to the perineal nerve, you lose that dorsiflexion, and now the foot flops down. Okay, and so if you're trying to walk, um, when your foot is like this, you have to lift your leg up higher to avoid tripping over the foot. Okay, so these patients lift their leg up high, um, and that's called the steppage gait. And so perineal neuropathy would be the most common cause of that. Right, an antalgic gait is not really neurologic. This is, if you've ever sprained your ankle or something, you have knee pain, you have kind of a limping gait and uh, just because of the pain. Now, symmetrical gait disorders, we divide into either wide-based or narrow-based. Okay, so one example of wide-based gait, it's called sensory ataxic. And um, don't get hung up on the word uh, ataxic here. This does not mean a cerebellar problem, even though that word is used. It's really a sensory problem. Um, so remember last time we were talking about proprioception, that it goes up the dorsal columns or the posterior columns. And so that tells you where your limbs are in space. Okay, so if we have a condition that affects the posterior columns, and there are a number of different conditions, B12 deficiency uh, we'll talk about in the next test cycle. Um, if you have B12 deficiency, you lose myelination to the posterior columns. And so these patients have a significant loss of proprioception. So these patients, when they walk, they don't know where their legs are in space. Okay, so to stable themselves, they will spread their legs apart, and they usually walk with a stomping gait. Okay, so they're very loud. If you hear them coming in from the waiting room and making this really banging sound as they come in, then the, they're stomping to try to get some proprioception up to the brain, some sense of where their legs are in space. Okay, so a sensory ataxic gait kind of looks wide-based, stomping. Uh, very similar to a lesion of the cerebellum, and remember I told you that it's usually the midline of the cerebellum that gives you the gait problem. So like a, a lesion of the cerebellar vermis will give a patient, again, this kind of a wide-based, unsteady gait. And if more of the cerebellum is affected, then they may have some finger-to-nose ataxia as well. All right, and two narrow-based gait disorders... Um, if we have a lot of upper motor neuron, like diffuse upper motor neuron disease, cerebral palsy would be an, a good example of that, then these patients have what's called a scissored gait. And I'll show you a brief video of a child with cerebral palsy. And the, the feet scissor when they walk. Okay, they cross over. And so it's a very narrow base. Okay, so as a, as a big picture, um, a narrow based gait uh, often suggests upper motor neuron, a wide based gait should make you think of a cerebellar ataxia problem. All right, and then finally we have what's called a festinating gait or a shuffled gait, and this is seen in Parkinson's disease, where the patient just can't take the nice, big, normal step stride. The, the, the step stride becomes narrower and narrower, and eventually they just may literally shuffle along, and oftentimes they have what's called gait freezing, where they're walking along and all of a sudden the feet will just lock up and they can't move them at all. Okay, so we'll do a little show and tell here and just go through some different um, gait problems. Neurology is quite visual, so um, the more things that you see, I think it just tends to stick better. All right, so here's a patient that has... Okay, let me see you walk a little bit. As the gait is kind of, he looks unsteady. Okay, turn, turn. And so you couldn't be sure without doing some other things on exam, but we can see, look, his, his feet are kind of far apart. He's not really stomping. Unsteady, trying to turn around there. Wide base gait to try to provide some stability. So this would fit best uh, with a cerebellar uh, wide based gait ataxia. Okay, so as I mentioned, there would be a big differential for that, but alcoholism, um, certainly where I work at the VA, uh, unfortunately we see a fair amount of that, 
uh, would be a common cause. Okay, here is a patient with Parkinson's disease. And this would be a more advanced Parkinson's, but you can see the step stride is very small. And he's walking along, and now his feet kind of lock up. That's called gait freezing. They get stuck, and then he just kind of shuffles along. And turning around is really hard if you have Parkinson's disease in this an advanced state. So very difficult for him. has to kind of shuffle around there to try to turn from one direction to the other. Going through doorways, interestingly, is often where patients with Parkinson's have the most gait freezing. They, they will tell you if they walk through any narrow space that that's often when uh, the feet just seem like they're glued to the floor. Okay, he did fairly well going through the doorway there. Okay. Here's a hemiplegic gait. I put this up and then realized that this individual is giving a demonstration of a hemiplegic gait. He <laughs> doesn't really have a hemiplegic gait, but he did a good job of it. So anyway, there it is. Um, here's a child with cerebral palsy. So this is an example of scissoring. Narrow base, and the feet just kind of cross over. Okay, so again, why is this helpful? We could just watch the patient come in from the waiting room, and we're already the mind is starting to work on what perhaps might be going on. Um, here's a patient I saw some time ago with a perineal neuropathy. And um, um, since we haven't talked about the perineal nerve and all yeah, of that, I think I will maybe skip over his I, uh, story because, to, uh, uh, but let me just uh, dog, uh, skip so forward and show you his walking. You right <laughs> okay, so he has a right foot drop, he has some loss of muscle, uh, muscles that are supplied by the okay, perineal so nerve. The last thing I'll show here are just some reflexes. Okay, well I can show you reflex exam one more time. Tell the reflexes are two plus, but they are. Rest. The key thing is they're okay. symmetrical. Now the walking. Okay. Last thing we'll do is we'll just check your walking. So go ahead and walk uh, down. And the notice. Has to lift the right leg. Kind of subtle. Just a bit higher. But he has to lift that right leg up a little higher because the foot wants to flop down. Okay. Okay, and that would be more of a, a little bit subtle. Uh, that's a steppage gait. Okay, now I'll show you this even though we're not talking about this, but there are a number of what are called psychogenic gates. So uh, maybe the patient is malingering for some reason. There's a lawsuit and they're trying to um, gain support for that. Or they have some, this is a physical manifestation of an underlying psych psychiatric illness. Um, and there are about 30 or more known types of psychogenic gait. And when you see a patient walking this way, you know, okay, this is not neurologic. This is psychogenic. So here's a patient we saw not too long ago. <coughs> and these patients, we will often just stand back. It looks like they're going to fall, but they won't. And so you just want to observe what they do. You want me to walk there or just walk to the table? Actually... You can take maybe, just walk to the table. How about that for our safety, your safety? Just walk wherever you want me to walk. That, sit up, go ahead and sit down, back on the exam table. That'll be perfect. Okay, backwards isn't working. 
Okay, and I wouldn't expect you to look at that and to know confidently. I mean, this takes some clinical experience and savvy, but, um, but this was an, is an example of a psychogenic gait. It doesn't fit any of our other categories. And usually what we like to really confirm this is if you have a bunch of other um, kind of non-genuine findings on exam, things that are just not consistent, then that helps to um, support the diagnosis. And oftentimes, um, I used to have my clinic right looking out over the parking lot. And so I've, there were a number of cases where, you know, I saw a patient in the exam room, and then I watched them out in the parking lot nicely walking, you know, normally. <laughs> and so that, that, that clearly pointed to... We see some amazing things. I mean, whatever field you go into, uh, years ago I saw a patient who was in a wheelchair. He'd sued... Uh, I think it was FedEx over an accident. He was in a wheelchair basketball league, and his exam was, was kind of like this, with inconsistent findings. And um, anyway, his physical therapist called me a year later and uh, saw him hopping out of a Corvette at the spaghetti factory in uh, Malibu. And so <laughs> uh, anyway, that was the first confirmation that this was, this was a psychogenic, or in that case, malingering. So I'm going to show you, uh, just to finish up, uh, two patients with multiple sclerosis. I don't expect you to know anything about multiple sclerosis, but um, the reason I'm showing these is that multiple sclerosis, you get lesions throughout the brain, spinal cord, cerebellum, and um, so we can see a lot of findings on neurologic examination. So I'm just going to skip forward to the, the story here. Okay. Your hands out straight right in front of you like this. There's a little bit of a tremor. I was a neurology resident here filming this. Nose. This was a long time ago. Notice he has some That's ataxia. With finger to nose testing. Worse on the left. The other hand. A little bit on the right. Good. And then take the right hand and do the finger tapping. Real the fast, finger tapping is very fast. helpful. It's a pretty good job there How on the, the right. Hand? But if you can see on the left, he has a hard time tapping right on the end of his thumb. It kind of taps on either side. Okay. Went to my finger. Ten. Okay, now he has a right INO. Okay, so it's one more example of this. So again, the best thing is look at the bridge of the nose. And what you should notice is that when he looks to the left, that this right eye lags behind. Okay, the, the left eye kicks out quickly, the right eye lags behind. Finger, ten, finger, ten, finger, ten, finger, ten, finger, ten. So since multiple sclerosis affects central nervous system pathways, that's where these upper motor neurons, like the cortical spinal tract, are located, um, you expect to find upper motor neuron findings. Right, right. 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 So this is how we formally check for clonus. You have a quick dorsiflexion. Notice you get several beats there. Several beats of clonus. Right there over here on the right. Keeps going. Okay, so that's a good example of clonus, upper motor neuron. It's pretty much the same clonus Okay. Now, so MS affects upper motor neurons, affects the cerebellum, and so the gait could take any number of different patterns, but if you just watch him walk, it's a fairly narrow base. Right, and so a spastic gait tends to have a narrow base. Now turn around. Keep going. See how the feet are kind of scissoring across. And come back one more time. All right, 
So um, let me see if you have any questions about the neurologic examination. Anything we talked about over the last four and a half, five hours? Yes. Uh, prognosis for MS, uh, I think, uh, was it a year or two ago, MS was, uh, in, in a big study, felt to be the most successful breakthroughs of any condition in medicine a year or two ago. And so when I was a neurology resident, the very first medication came out for MS. Before that, there really wasn't any intervention at all. And now I think we have like nine or ten, um, and, and some of the recent ones are highly effective. So it's a real success story. Uh, most patients respond very well to treatment, so it's a rewarding condition to treat, definitely. Yeah. Yes. What should you know about ALS? Um, nothing. So I used ALS as just a way to show you uh, upper and lower motor neuron findings. So I'm not going to ask you any question about ALS, but you do need to know what are upper motor neuron findings? What are lower motor neuron findings? And so if you're shown something on exam, like um, here's a patient that has atrophy as, of his right arm, well, don't pick a lesion of the cortical spinal tract, right? That's an upper motor neuron, so it's going to be some kind of a lower motor neuron problem. Yeah, so MS, ALS, we're not asking you questions about these diseases. Is there another hand? Yes. Yes, the ataxic lady who was clumsy, yes. Yes. Okay, so did she have two lesions since she had ataxia on both sides? Well, a condition like multiple sclerosis, again, you don't need to know about, but you get diffuse demyelination, and so you can affect pathways coming from both cerebellar hemispheres. Um, I actually don't know that that's what she, she had. There are a bunch of conditions that can affect. If the whole cerebellum is affected, you're going to have ataxia on both sides. Yes? So the question is what I said about the last two inches. So especially in a mild case of ataxia, when the patient's doing this, back to your finger, back to their nose, it tends to be the last little inch where they'll do this, and then going out to their finger. This whole distance may be okay, but that last little fine part where you've got to touch something small, that's when the hand tends to go back and forth. In a very severe ataxia, it looks like this. The whole hand is going back and forth. And in those patients, I don't tell them go back to their nose because I don't want them to poke an eye out. So I'll maybe have them go back to their chin, a little safer if in a severe case. Yes? Okay, how would you use the Romberg test? So again, you have the patient stand up, look straight ahead, eyes closed. And um, so we're to, to be able to have balance, you need vision. You need proprioception to know where your feet are, and you need the vestibular apparatus telling you know, where your head is in space and so on. And so we use the test in someone that comes in saying, I'm unsteady on my feet, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And so in that patient unsteady on their feet, when they close their eyes, if we then begin seeing this, then we have it pretty much narrowed down to two big categories. Either they don't have proprioception or they have a vestibular problem. If they don't have proprioception, you should be able to figure that out by moving their toe up and down. And so if they sway with the Romberg test and they don't know where their foot is when you're moving it up and down, then it's a proprioceptive issue. Um, if someone has a vestibular problem and they're swaying around, they're usually going to complain of vertigo, right? So it's usually going to be I'm unsteady on my feet and things are moving around. And then we look for other things that would um, confirm that. Things that uh, we haven't really gone over yet in class. Yeah. Any other questions? You're all clear with the eye movements and INO and all that? Yes. Can you get a hemiplegia with cerebral palsy? Absolutely. Yeah, and there are a whole bunch of variants of, of what can be affected. But I would say more often a hemiplegia is going to be a distinctly focal lesion like a stroke or a hemorrhage in the brain. That would be a more likely cause than uh, cerebral palsy. Yes? Okay, so uh, the question is when we're talking about visual saccades, is that um, visual pursuit, so we talked about three types of eye movements. Visual pursuit is where you're tracking something. 
you're following something. So that's vision, occipital lobe, communicating with the brainstem circuits that we talked about, PPRF, uh, MLF, 6, and 3. Um, and that's, that's different than the saccad, saccadic eye movements that come from the frontal eye fields. So to check that, I might hold up my finger and imagine I have a pen over here, and I'll have the patient look finger, pen, finger, pen. And remember, almost all of the INOs that uh, I showed you, the examiner was saying finger, pen, finger, pen. That's a saccadic quick eye movement back and forth, and that just tends to be the best way to bring out a whole lot of eye movements. So that would be a saccade, a quick eye movement. If we're having the patient follow our finger like this, that would be pursuit. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, in a say again, a patient with a lesion of the frontal eye fields? Yes? Oh, during sleep? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think so. The, so the question was, if you have a lesion of the saccadic gaze center, would they have a problem with the rapid eye movements during sleep? Um, I, I've never even thought about that. So uh, I suppose theoretically, but um, probably not. The, the big thing if you have a lesion of the frontal eye fields is you're using, losing that force that is wanting to push your eyes in the opposite direction. So that's why the, what, what you need to know about that is if you have a lesion there, that the eyes are just going to drift towards that side. So that would be the more important thing. Okay, anything else? Good. So I'll see some of you in the case studies next week. Um, I have a patient at 9, so I'm going to need to get out of here. But uh, if there are any more questions, feel free to send me an email. Thanks.